Hey, I'm David Adelsheim. The story of Adelsheim Vineyard began in 1971. That was the year that Ginny and I decided to risk our life savings on a piece of property in Oregon's North Willamette Valley. Looking back now, we were one of just 10 families that made wine before 1980 from grapes planted on our properties in that region. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of what became our first vineyard, we wanted to tell our story. But we quickly realized that the only way to truly tell our story was to tell the stories of that entire first generation. Our winery team proposed an idea, a series of video conversations with the founders of those first 10 wineries and me. I loved it and set to work contacting my old friends. In each interview, we wanted to go beyond their widely known histories to discover who these people really were and what led them to build our uniquely collaborative, and at least from today's perspective, incredibly successful wine industry. This is our shared story. We met with Diana Lett of the Irie Vineyards on October 5th, 2020, in the yard behind her home looking at their second oldest vineyard planting. Soon after their wedding in October of 1966, Diana and David Lett started transplanting 3,000 young vines from the nursery David had planted near Corvallis in February 1965, using what Diana calls her wedding shovel. But I'm jumping ahead. Let's get the real story from Diana. So we're sitting, your house is over there, and the second vineyard you and David planted is right behind us. We're, we're sitting in the middle of your driveway. Yes. We would be hit by the dump truck if it came in delivering gravel. Yes. But it's such a cool place. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and it allows us, I mean, this is the view that I remember when we were in your kitchen and in the dining room, these are the vines that we saw. Yeah. Your husband, David, is pretty much the beginning of the wine industry. For most people, the story leads to David Lett and his uh, escape from uh, dental school and going to Davis and uh, meeting people and starting to realize that uh, Oregon would be a great place for this. I remember him telling me and others that when he was in Europe for that year, I mean, he visited Chuck Corey in Alsace, but he visited Portugal. Oh, he went to England, Germany, France, Alsace, and Northern Portugal. He had a... Um, letter of recommendation from his professors down at Davis. And he got the royal treatment wherever he went. And so he really got to talk to a lot of growers and producers and really looked into climate and what varieties were growing where and why. And one of the things was, why are you growing this variety here where it barely gets to maturity instead of something that's a lot easier? And they said, um, you know, well, because the flavors are better. And we weren't doing that in this country. Right. Well, our wine industry in this country was really just getting started. Particularly for... Anywhere, anywhere for, in the yeah. country. Yeah, yeah. It was just, we were just on the beginning of that right. movement. So he had fallen in love with Pinot Noir. And that was it. Why was he interested in Pinot? I mean, where did that come uh -huh. from? Uh-huh. Well, that was one of the benefits of being in class at the University of California at Davis. They had enough money to buy some really good burgundies and poor tastings for the students. Mm -hmm. And David said that was his second cosmic brick. The first one was, oh, I think I'll grow grapes. And then the second was, I've got to do Pinot Noir. This is it. So... Then people and that said, really came from that those, year and those, a half at Davis. Yeah, those tastings at Davis, or in his classes at Davis, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, so he, then he became very fascinated with 
It only grow, they're only growing this well in Burgundy. So is there someplace else it could grow? And so that, that put him on his quest. When would this have been bottled? This that is 1970. Been, it would have been bottled in July or August, and it would have been right after that that we would have had the dinner, and David probably brought that in. Not necessarily that bottle, but one that looked just like right. it. Well, um, And that was the first bottle of Willamette Valley wine I'd ever had, and probably most people had ever that had, was had the, That was our first vintage, and, and Chuck Curry had his first vintage that year, too. This was our first Pinot Noir. And, when, and David was disappointed in it when it came in because he thought the color was a little too light and it wasn't like perfect. And he wanted our first wine. So we had a friend, Clive Van Cleve and, and Doug Lynch, they were, they were working on a label, this calligraphy and label, but they also did this little fun, it was gonna be for just less formal wines. Right. And we could do it whatever we wanted, white or red or whatever. But, so David decided to go ahead and put the, pe the first Pinot Noir in this, the 70 Pinot Noir. Years later, we tasted it, you know, or several years later, we tasted it, and it was fine, and yeah. it was great. And oh, he said, oh, I could kick myself for putting it in the, <laughs> people thought it was May wine. <laughs> As Ginny and I were thinking about moving out to the country, we had a friend in Portland who worked for Bill Blosser at oh, Portland the State. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, got her to introduce us. Jenny and I just, yeah, we instant. just really loved each other right off the yeah. bat. Yeah. And then in May, um, they, Bill and Susan invited you guys right. and mm -hmm. us right. and the kids right. to a picnic down at their house. And uh, you and David hit it off great. Yep. And I remember you all went off to look at grapes or do something, and Jenny came here to the house with me. And we just, we started yakking then, and it was the beginning of God knows how many hours on the phone and talking <laughs> and all that. So, yeah. So she's, she's been my best friend for 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> she's the kindest person I ever met. And, you know... I, I I treasure that. Yeah. yeah. So. So. Oh, <laughs> you so forgot that part. I forgot it. I forgot it I totally. Forgot. Oh yeah. Put but, her up there. <laughs> but that's yet another one of the things that connected our two families. This is really Ginny expressing her thanks to you. It's it's more than that too, but it's specifically you. It was our connection. Yeah. 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 And that. You're the only person in the wine industry that is, was on our bottles. Everybody else were friends, that, but you were both a friend and obviously in the wine business. And so um, I think this was, for the longest time, this was what our winery was known for, was this label with you on it. The woman on the label, yeah. Well, it was the woman, but this label had you on it. And for those that bothered to look at what it said, someplace, maybe not this vintage, but somewhere or other, you were identified, and I think people figured that out. And <laughs> Jason said, oh, I can't even go in a wine shop without my mom looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I threatened to ask you what, what you what you thought about being on our label, but... Uh, oh, I thought it was fun and kind of glamorous, and... and uh, what I loved to do was it was really mess with people's minds, you know. <laughs> why is she on your label and why are you on their label? That's weird, you know. So that, then that led into the whole friendship thing and, the, yep. you know, and it was fun. And I got a new appreciation for Jenny's art because it took hours and hours oh God, and hours of drawing, but we got yeah. to talk the whole time. So that was great. <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. Arguably, Yamhill County is the center of Oregon's wine yeah, industry yeah. because we preserve the hillsides to be planted. Yeah. Um, and uh, Washington County didn't do as good a job, and, um, and this was as close as people could get without having to pay the prices for housing sites yeah. to plant uh, grapes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And they were all like these beautiful south-facing slopes yeah. and just the right, you know, everything was perfect right. 
And oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you all prevailed on that. That was no, good. No, that was, that was an important thing. There's yeah. no question. Um, you know, we opened this wine. I know. We never I was dairy. getting kind of thirsty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking about how good that would taste. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing this. Yeah. Well, 2018 Pinot Gris. Yeah. I just remember we all gathered for a photograph of the Yamhill Wine Growers Association brochure. Or maybe it was just to advertise the Thanksgiving tasting weekend. But we, we were all gathered over at Blossers, and I remember the, we all kind of got ready for the photograph. And the guy says, no, no, just the men, the winemakers. And so... Well, I've got the photograph. I'll show you. You were in it. <laughs> oh, I know the photograph. <laughs> yeah, but he said, no, just the men, the winemakers. And so here's this iconic photograph now of you all gathered together, but you can't hear all the women in the background going, oh, you know, catcalling you guys. <laughs> we were hooting. <laughs> I, I didn't know that backstory. I, yeah. I, I mean, I probably yeah. was there. I mean, I was there. You were there, so, but it was yeah. just funny. He said, no, just the men, the winemakers. Wow. I know. They'd be, he, he would be rid out of town on oh, a rail yeah. no, at this I mean, point. <laughs> well, I, I mean, obviously it was a different time. But, uh, oh, yes. But still, it's, that's pathetic. Well, and, and also, you know, we took, it, we took it as a laugh. We thought it was funny, kind of. Yeah, I wonder. Kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. One of the things that I point to is that David and Chuck and Dickie Rath and Dick Ponzi and a number of the others, even me just barely, were all born before the end of World War II. We weren't really baby boomers. We were pre-baby boomers. We were, yeah, whatever, whatever that was. But it seems to me that that previous generation, which came of age in the, in the 50s and Early and, 60s, yeah. And, and really lived through the idealism of the, the, the beginning of the Kennedy uh, years, that that idealism sort of became part of our industry. Yeah, I think that we brought that to the industry, yeah, yeah. that idealism. And yeah. that had, had the industry not started for 10 more years... It would have been different. It would have been very different yeah. because it wouldn't have had that idealistic base that building a successful industry is almost more important than the individual success of any of any, of any of the, Yeah. Well, and I think um, to that point, a lot of us might not have gotten into the thing in the first place if, right. if we hadn't been kind of ide idealistic and looking towards that. You know? Yeah, we would have been looking for something that would make us money. Yeah, or just, yeah. Yeah. And in, instead, we were looking for something that we could build to be important. So this can be, this is so creative and, and it's wide open and we can do anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, as I was going through a lot of memories here, I was thinking there were a lot of sad times and there were some mm. scary times. How would you describe your role and David's role in helping ensure that collaboration was part of this because it doesn't just happen. Well, I always go, it's always a, it's always a combination of luck and pluck whenever <laughs> these things happen, you know, and I think we had the luck was in having a group of people that probably we accidentally had a good chemistry together, pretty good chemistry. Once these ideals were explained yeah. or, or illustrated, yeah. it was like, oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah. you know. The story goes back to you and David. And it's, it's not that you necessarily told people what to do or told them that they couldn't do this or that, but I, I think it was a very strong process of leading by example, if you will that you were showing a way forward where you could be focused on quality, didn't have to be big, sell it yourself, sell it, not have a tasting room, um, do the right thing in terms of taking care of the earth, um, and, and have a successful business. I can't believe it worked. <laughs> I just can't believe it. <laughs> 
well, this was fun. I was, I was nervous about it. And also, the weight of memories is heavy sometimes. Yeah, yeah it is. And uh, I was thinking, though, but we had a lot of fun. A lot of music, a lot of wine, a lot of great food, a wonderful people. There was a people. night of dancing, even. In my... <gasps> Do you remember the night we cleared, you and I, we cleared the dance floor to the kazoo band playing <laughs> varsity drag. <laughs> we were great. <laughs> I don't know that I remember the kazoo band. That was, part. That was oh, the best no, part. Yeah. That's the best part, the kazoo band. <laughs> We were great, or at least we thought we were. <laughs> I so appreciate you not just sitting down now, but discussing this and thinking about it. And what you will, what you will have contributed to this is this, the, the, the special gravitas that really the founding family of the Willamette Valley wine industry can provide in a way that nobody else can. And thank it, you for asking. Oh, for the interview. I've really enjoyed it and of course I love you. Yeah. No, <laughs> so. It, it's so great to be with you and um, thanks. <laughs>